It's a great honor to represent various counties throughout the state of Utah with the hard work they've done and done with Houston. We really appreciate it. And also, uh, I should let you know that it came to my attention today that our law firm or our predecessor law firm actually represented the Utah Association of Counties for many, many years in the 60s and 70s. Um, I can also tell you that I wasn't there at that point in time. Uh, I'm old, but not quite that old. So but it's great to work with so many fine officials from throughout the state of Utah. I was thinking about this presentation over the past couple of days, and I realized that throughout my career, primarily when I was just going through college and then initially out of college, that I've worked at virtually every level of government I work for Salt Lake City Corporation, I work for Salt Lake County, I work for the state of Utah, and I worked in the U.S. Congress. And so I can tell you, I've always had such a great admiration for government. I've always felt like government employees work harder than they get credit for and are paid less than they deserve. Uh, but I can tell you this too, my absolute favorite job in government was when I was a tourist guy at the Utah State Capitol Building back in the day. And I was told that I could spin a yarn like nobody else. So I'm going to try to stick to the truth today. But sometimes when those persons come in and ask some of those crazy questions, I didn't think it was too fast by embellish the history. Just a tad. But so anyway, so I'll try not to do that today. I also think I had one of the worst jobs in government. Um, and I so appreciate the people that do this. I worked on the desk at Salt Lake City Corporation dealing with parking tickets and moving violations when people came in to pay those things. Nobody was happy there. They were nothing at all like the tourists that visited me when I was at the Capitol. So I have a lot of admiration for those jobs. But you know, we all know that there's a real difficult situation that we all face, and that's the public perception of people in different jobs, and especially in government jobs. And I was curious about that, so I took a minute and looked up a Gallup poll that was um, actually done from December 2nd through the 6th of 2015, so it's relatively recent. And as you'll note, that a lot of the professions that got um, very high or high for this question, please tell me how you would rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in these different fields. And nurses came out way on top, uh, people that were pharmacists, medical doctors, high school teachers. The highest, um, the highest profession, as far as this poll was concerned, the highest approval ratings were for police officers. And clergy came after that. Funeral directors, accountants, journalists, bankers, building contractors, lawyers, we showed up way down the list, and so on down the line. You looked and see that the last two um, categories, members of Congress, 8%, lobbyists, 7%. Well, so I wanted to dig down a little bit deeper on this and see how it applied to local government and federal government and see if that uh, held true. And as you can see, these were a series of um, surveys that were done going all the way back, in some instances, to the 70s, all the way up through this one, 2015. And if you look, the first category was members of Congress. And you can see that starting uh, in the category of very high or high, uh, their ratings have consistently been fairly low. They, they saw some increases over the years, but in recent years, I think most of the recent years, they've been in single digit. Local office holders, on the other hand, um, not stellar um, reputation, but nevertheless much, much better than members of Congress. And you can see that they've been consistently going up through the years. This is a little bit inconsistent with what we see going on in the national situation. Judges got consistently high, if you consider 50 percentage to be high. Um, and then you look at police officers, again, who have fairly high marks. And I thought that was interesting in line of some of the news headlines we're seeing about concerns about police officers outside the state of Utah. Conflicts of interest, ethical dilemmas um, are splashed across the headlines every day. And especially in recent weeks and, and um, talking about the political campaigns that we're facing right now, 
um, all sorts of accusations of conflicts of interest. And recently, just last week, talking about the Panama Papers. Uh, then also this gubernatorial sex scandal in Alabama I thought was quite interesting. The governor has been accused of having sexual relations with a subordinate or actually reported up through to him. There's been discussions of articles of impeachment in the state of Alabama. And those articles of impeachment would have to be presented to the governor by the Speaker of the House, who happens to have 26 felony ethics violations pending against him right now, but are being set for trial. And the hearing, or the, or the trial, for the governor, if in fact they go forward with these um, articles of impeachment, they will be, the, the judge on that will be the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, who also had um, ethics violations and was removed from office for a period of time. So thank goodness we're not in Alabama. <laughs> See, there is some good news about this issue. So in talking about this, I think we really have to look first and foremost at <laughs> several of the statutes that apply uh, to this um, particular topic that address each and every one of you. The first is the Utah Public Officers and Employees Ethics Act. And I just want to take a minute and read this uh, purpose because I think it really sets it out. It really explains to us what we have to do in our various positions. To set forth standards of conduct for officers and employees of the state of Utah and its political subdivisions in areas where there are actual or potential conflicts of interest between their public duties and their private interests. In this manner, the legislature intends to promote the public interest and strengthen the faith and confidence of the people of Utah in the integrity of their government. It does not intend to deny any public officer or employee the opportunities available to all other citizens of the state to acquire private, economic, or other interests so long as this does not interfere with his full and faithful discharge of his public duties. So in other words, we have this, this fairly esoteric guideline that tells us that we have to do what we need to do to promote the public interest and strengthen the faith and confidence of the people. But on the other hand, there are certain exceptions to this. So it's constantly a battle between this side and that side and the balancing act that you have to do when you're trying to assess whether or not there's an actual or perceived conflict of interest. This statute goes on and talks about no public officer or public employee shall have personal investments in any business entity which will create a substantial conflict between his private interests and his public duties. And I want to put it out there for you that I put the full text of the two statutes we're going to be talking about in the materials that were handed out to you. We just cherry picked a few things that we thought might be of interest or something that we should reiterate with you as we go through this presentation today. And also, these are all paraphrased. So this is not the literal thing, but just take a look at the statutes. No person shall induce or seek to induce any public officer or public employee to violate any of the provisions of this chapter. The provisions of this chapter shall apply to all public officers and public employees. It goes on, and I won't read every bit of this to you, but just, just to talk about some of the key factors that I think are important. Um, this particular section also talks about improperly disclosing controlled information. All of you know that in your roles and your positions in, in public employment, that you come across a lot of important personal information, and all of those of you that are in policy making decisions also come across a lot of really critical information. And this, this particular statute talk, talks about not improperly disclosing that controlled information, and also to make sure that you don't use that particular information to further your own personal economic interests or to secure special um, privileges or exemptions from different things. So that's really important. It's akin to insider trading or insider dealing that we hear a lot about in the stock market, I think. And so you have to be very careful of these things. And we're talking about 
things that further substantially the officer or employee's personal economic interests or secure those special privileges or exemptions for himself or others. So it's not just this, the employee, but it's also their spouse, it's also significant other people in their lives, their children, and the statute talks about that as we go through this a little bit further. And, and it really talks to anything that would impair the independence of the judgment and performance of public duties. And, it, and also employment, other outside employment, we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we go through some of the cases that would interfere with the ethical execution of public duties and responsibilities. And when we talk about this economic benefit, the statute goes on to define that. And it, and it talks about, and it includes a loan at an interest rate that is substantially lower than a, a, the commercial rate, the ongoing rate. So in other words, if, if some bank or some other institution chooses to give a uh, county employee some loan at, you know, way down, really great interest, or an individual does that, that would be considered a gift under the statute or compensation for services at a rate substantially exceeding fair market value. So those are some of the guidelines you have to look at to see whether or not this constitutes a gift that's excluded by this particular uh, piece of legislation. It is an offense to knowingly receive a gift of substantial value or economic benefit that would improperly influence a reasonable person and again, in the law, we always talk about a reasonable person, and I'm sure that this room is full of reasonable people, correct? <laughs> who knows what it is? <laughs> I always I bring that up. Okay, who in this room says they're reasonable and could be the be no all in this situation? But we're talking about reasonable person. And if a reasonable person would think that this would cause some sort of um, person to depart from the faithful and partial uh, discharge of public duties, then that's problematic that a reasonable person should know that under the circumstances is primarily for the person of, or, or for the purpose of rewarding the public officer for actions taken. If the officer may be involved in government action directly affecting a donor or a lender, because we talk about not just monetary things, we talk about other things where somebody may be willing to donate a large sum of money or do something else, and that also may be suspect. So you have to take a close look at these things and be aware of it. Now, this, what's also important in this particular uh, statute is that there are things that do not apply. Occasional, non-pecuniary gifts having a value of less than $50. And also the statute and some of the comments that I've seen, you know, giving, a, a, giving somebody a, a gift for a birthday or flowers when they've lost a loved one. That's not going to be problematic under this particular statute. Uh, an award publicly presented in recognition of public service. That's, that's okay, too. Bonafide loans made in the ordinary course of business. So if somebody goes out and gets a, a mortgage or something like that, as long as it's consistent with what everybody else in similar situations is getting. Or legal political um, campaign contributions. So those are the things that are specifically excluded from the statute. Now the other law that I wanted to briefly mention before we get into some of the cases is County Officers and Employees Disclosure Act. And the purpose of this act I think is also important. The purposes of this chapter are to establish standards of conduct for county officers and employees and to require these persons to disclose conflicts of interest between their public duties and their personal interests. So again, we're talking about disclosure, and disclosure really is the key uh, to this law. We're going to talk a lot about that. This statute applies to any county employee except special employees, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Officers on special, regular, or full-time committees, agencies, or boards, whether compensated or not. And as Brad was mentioning, you know, you're on this particular voluntary board, you're on this particular government-related board, maybe you're not getting compensated for it. All of those types of things need to be disclosed, and this law applies to all of those individuals that do these kinds of things. And I bet most of you in this room sit on various committees and, 
agencies and boards and or your commissioners do or what have you. So you have to be very cognizant of that. And the statute also de uh, defines assist, and that includes help, represent, aid, advise, furnish information to, or otherwise provide assistance to a person or a business entity. And the statute also talks about business entities, meaning what you would expect it to mean. So, if you know anything that you do in furtherance of that particular business enti entity may be subject to this law. Compensation includes anything of economic value, which is paid, loaned, granted, given, donated, or transferred. So it's a pretty broad brushstroke with what constitutes compensation. Elected officer means, of course, somebody that's elected or appointed to county offices. Uh, governmental action. And this is critical when we start talking about what is uh, falls under the statute as well. Governmental action is defined as any decision, determination, finding, ruling, or order by the county government. The approval, denial, or failure to act on any grant, payment, award, license, contract, subcontract, transaction, decision, or, or sanction. So it's, again, it, virtually covers the whole gamut of these types of things. As we mentioned above, special employees may be excluded from this, and those include individuals that are hired on the basis of a contract to perform a special service for the county pursuant to an award of a contract following a public bid. So that's what we're talking about. Statute also defines uh, substantial interest, and this is critical as well means the ownership, either legally or equitably, by an individual, spouse, minor children, etc., of at least 10%. So there has to be disclosure of anything greater than 10% interest. Um, it is an offense for an elected or an appointed officer to, um, to disclose confidential information acquired by their position, as we talked about a minute ago, use or attempt to use the officer's official position to secure special privileges, knowingly receive or solicit any gift or loan if the gift or loan tends to influence the officer in the discharge of the officer's official duties. This section again is inapplicable to an occasional gift of $50,000. Oh, $50,000? 50, $50, <laughs> wow, sign me up. <laughs> you bet I'm not influenced. I'll take it. Okay, so $50 or less. Uh, so you can go to dinner with somebody, basically. Um, a, an award uh, publicly given, as we talked about before, and the loan, as long as it's consistent with what's going on in the industry and being political campaign donations. May not apply to the actions of members of a county legislative body who is also a member of the governing board of a provider of mental health or substance abuse services. And that's kind of a quirky exception to it that, to be honest with you, I read it several times over the past couple of days and I'm not entirely sure I fully understand what is excluded there, but we have a case that we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, it does not apply to encouraging support from public or private individuals or institutions, whether in financial contributions or by other means, on behalf of an organization or activity that benefits the community. So there's nothing wrong with encouraging individuals to sign up, um, you know, for United Way or anything of that nature. Those kinds of things are considered as exceptions to this. Okay. No elected or appointed officer may receive compensation for assisting with the transaction involving the county unless he or she files a sworn statement and discloses in an open meeting the information required. And then that disclosure has to be filed within 10 days of the date that they're entering the agreement to do this, or 10 days before the receipt of compensation. And it becomes part of the public record. And one of the things that I'm gonna say repeatedly through this is that we wanna make sure that, that the people that work for the counties know that they need to disclose, that they feel free to disclose, and that there is a system in place to encourage them to disclose this information. And that is by far the best way to protect the county or the officials involved. The statement and disclosure shall contain the following information. Name and address of the officer, name and address of the person or business or entity involved, brief, a brief description of the transaction or the service to be rendered. 
as well as any kind of compensation for that. Um, every appointed or elected an officer who is an officer, director, agent, or employee, or the owner of a substantial interest, again, 10% or greater, in any business entity which is subject to the regulation of the county, again, will disclose their position, the precise nature and value of their interest, what they do for the organization, that kind of thing. And they're supposed to do this when they're first elected or appointed to a position, and then they're supposed to do it again annually. And if there is going to be some sort of a decision that directly impacts that business, then they should disclose it at the beginning of that meeting. This section does not apply to instances where the value of the interest does not exceed $2,000, life insurance policies and annuities, things of that nature. So uh, every appointed or elected officer who is an officer, director, agent, or employee, or owner of a substantial interest in any business entity which does business with the county shall publicly disclose the nature of his, his or her interest in the business entity. <coughs> I know probably many of you have dealt with this and are very familiar with this, but I think it's always good to review it because of some of the issues that come up. <coughs> okay, the statute goes on and says investment creating conflicts of interest with duties or disclosures in personal interest or investment by any elected or appointed officials of a county which creates a potential or actual conflict between the official's personal interest and his public duty shall be disclosed in an open meeting to members of the body, as I talked about just a moment ago. And of course, it's against the law to induce an officer or an employee to violate provisions uh, of this statute. And you can't do anything to try to get them to do that. The violation is a misdemeanor and it could result in removal um, from office. So it's an important thing. There's a, there is a mechanism that's in place by uh, this particular statute for looking at and dealing with complaints as they come up. But um, the statute is pretty broad on who can bring the complaint. Uh, any member of the public potentially could bring a complaint and probably have, and you've probably dealt with that on occasion. But a, a county may establish by ordinance an ethics commission to review such complaints. A person filing a complaint for a violation of this part shall file the complaint with the County Ethics Commission if they have in fact created one, and if the county has not with the Political Subdivisions Ethics Review Commission, and they will uh, review the situation and make a determination. Um, and it could result in a rescission of any transaction that took place in violation of the statute. And so the county may rescind or void the contract or subcontract entered in, into pursuant to the, that transaction without returning any part of the consideration received by the county. Probably not the best way to get some sort of a loophole, but times are tough. Okay. Anyway, I want to talk to you about some of the cases that have come up through the courts in the state of Utah, as well as some of the other jurisdictions. Um, and also to invite you to ask any questions or raise any issues or concerns that you might have in connection with what you do in your various positions. The first case I wanted to talk to you briefly about was one that you may have heard of. It's called Hugh Miller versus Ogden's Ogden City Civil Service Commission. Do many of you heard of this particular case? Okay, this is kind of an interesting case in some respects. A city police officer actually appealed from the city civil service commission's decision affirming his termination with the city police department. And what what really seemed to have happened in this particular situation, oh my gosh, is that all ready? Um, okay. I've told them to give me a heads up when I have <laughs> So I know how much time I have left. Um, okay, so anyway, in this particular case, what happened is this um, gentleman um, who was a police officer and it's really not uh, clear to me from reading the case whether or not he actually had a towing service that he was a part of the business. I don't know if any of you from Ogden recall this, Brad may, um, or if he just received some sort of a kickback or something <coughs> of that nature, but the city had a pretty clear towing policy in place as it related to police officers. 
And what happened here was that the city caught wind of this, and apparently he was getting some sort of economic benefit as a result of this relationship with this towing company. And he was called in uh, for his very interview, and at that point in time, he apparently lied about what was happening. And there was several other officers who were also involved with this towing business. And apparently were getting, I, I, for lack of a better word, kickbacks, or they were part of the company or whatever. And they did not lie, but this gentleman lied. And so he was, he was terminated. Actually, all three of them were terminated. And um, then this one gentleman was the one that appealed the decision. <clears throat> and what was really important, I think, here is what the, the uh, Utah Court of Appeals said in its decision, affirming his termination. And they. That I should tell you, they really focused primarily on the fact that he lied about what had happened. But what the court said in a footnote is uh, instructive to us in what we're doing with uh, police officers and other individuals that may have outside business interests. It's, this is what the court said. Although Hugh Miller also violated OPD's towing policy, had a conflict of interest and disobeyed a superior officer's <coughs> order, his and his answering falsely by itself permits the sanction of termination, at least absence, uh, absent concerns about disproportionality. Therefore, we need not discuss whether the, the other violations individually or collectively permit termination. We next consider the disproportionality claim. And he was saying that being fired was uh, too severe of a punishment for what had happened in that situation. And the Court of Appeals said, no, we're going to uphold what Ogden, Ogden City decided there. The importance of this case, of course, as you can tell, is that it was his termination was really based primarily on him not telling the truth. However, there were some other uh, critical violations. The next case I want to talk to you about uh, briefly is State uh, versus Nichols. And this is interesting. Have, have any of you heard of this particular case? This, this is another Utah case. It's an older case. It came up in 1986. And what happened here was that this Nichols, husband and wife, had a very elaborate plan to burn down their house. And they were convicted of arson. And this was their attempt to overturn the conviction. And the court did not overturn the conviction. And you may say, how does that relate to what we're talking about here with conflict of interest? But what happened, one of their allegations was that there was a conflict of interest on the part of the prosecutor. So again, prosecutorial misconduct is what we were talking about in this particular case. The prosecutor uh, in this case, uh, several years before this all came down, there were uh, several of the arson task force members or um, arson investigators that were terminated. And this particular prosecutor was on the arson task force. He had all sorts of extensive training in arson investigation. And so what he did was form a private company with these people that were laid off to do arson investigations, not only for Salt Lake County, but for any other political subdivision that wanted to hire them. And they had done this type of business. He didn't disclose it. And when the Salt Lake County attorney found out about it, he called this person in. Uh, I think probably read in the Riot Act, and told him he had to disengage from this business. He had to get as far away from it as he could, which is apparently what happened. He did that approximately six months before the trial of these Nichols uh, people, the husband and wife. And what's really important here is that that particular company did not investigate the fire involving the Nichols. So the court upheld um, their, the determination that they were guilty. The conviction stood the ground. And, and the court actually talked a little bit about why it didn't think there was a conflict of interest in this case. And I want to just read you briefly what they said. Um, the statute provides that no public officer or public employee shall accept other employment which he might expect would impair his independence of judgment in the performance of his public duties. A public prosecutor who is involved with a corporation that investigates possible arson and insurance fraud cases for insurance companies should not be also be representing the state in the prosecution of similar cases. This would appear to be a conflict of interest. 
However, in this case, they said because there was enough distance between them that they were not going to overturn the conviction. However, that's not what happened in a similar case involving the same individual. So that was that. The next case, I want to, how much time? We're really close. Um, eight, ten minutes. Okay. 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 There's just too many of these cases. Um, and I find them all really interesting. I don't know about you guys. So the next one is Utah Public Employees Association versus the state. And in this particular situation, I think this is a, a, a kind of an interesting case as well. Back in the day, Governor Matheson decided that individuals that worked for the Division of Wildlife Resources could not participate in future drawings for permits to hunt uh, buffalo, bighorn, sheep, and moose. Have any of you heard of this case? Okay, so um, anyway, because he, he felt like there was a conflict of interest, or there was the appearance of a conflict of interest. Well, these individuals got quite upset because they participated in this um, permit drawings for several years, and they wanted to continue to do it. And so they brought a, a claim against the state of Utah alleging a violation of their constitutional rights of due process and, and equal protection. And in this particular case, the, the uh, Utah Court of Appeals uh, said that the governor and all public employees have a responsibility to avoid all actual and potential conflicts of interest between their public duties and their private interests. And the court went on to say, although there is no evidence of impropriety, it clearly lies within the prerogative of the governor to adopt a policy so as to avoid even the appearance thereof. If a DWR employee is not directly involved in conducting the drawing, at the very least, he has direct contact with those individuals, those employees who do. Furthermore, it is arguably that DWR employees with permits could have competitive edge over hunters <laughs> with their knowledge about the habits and whereabouts of the herds and access to certain radio sensing devices placed on the animals for herd control and regula regulation by DWR. Given the valid public purpose of maintaining a completely above board drawing and the fact that the governor's classification policy was rationally related to, this, to such objectives, DWR employees have not suffered a violation of their constitutional rights. So I think in essence what they were saying is that there could be even a greater or a higher bar set. And I think you all know that as a public employee, there are oftentimes higher bars set for you. Um, another Utah case that I wanted to mention briefly that I think also deals with outside employment, which is a real critical issue for you, trying to assess whether or not this particular outside employment would constitute a conflict of interest as you're assessing this, and whether or not you can ask the employees questions about this. This case goes to that. In this situation, um, Salt Lake City employees sought declaratory relief, permanently enjoining the city fire department chief, city personnel director, city commission from promulgating questionnaires concerning city employees outside employment. The district court granted the declaratory judgment and city officials appeal. So in other words, lower court said, yeah, the city's gone too far. You can't ask all those questions. The Utah Supreme Court reversed saying, it seems to us that the plain wording of the act, its interdiction and its stated obvious purpose does not prohibit a state agency boss from asking simple, reasonable questions with respect to compliance therewith, but actually is an invitation for him to do so in order to assist in carrying out another purpose of the legislation found in Section 2, to promote the public interest and strengthen the faith and confidence of the people of Utah in the integrity of their government. We think the questions were neither onerous or, nor unreasonable, nor violative of the act, and the questionnaire is not another law, charter, or ordinance that defines what conflict of interest is. Now this is, this is kind of problematic, and we have some other issues that we'll be talking about tomorrow, about background checks and some of the things that you can ask. I think we have to keep in mind it says as long as it's reasonable, it's not onerous, it's probably not, you know, it doesn't get into too much of personal information, the court's going to say that it's okay. But there could be a situation where there's too much. How am I doing? 
It's three minutes. Okay, we'll keep going for a minute. I'm going to I'm going to really race through some of these other cases that come from other jurisdictions. They're newer than cases in the state of Utah. I don't think we've had as many issues, even though we know of certain um, problems that are ongoing in the state of Utah where there's allegations of conflicts of interest. This, this case is Ruiz versus Hope for Children. So Hope for Children, outside contractor, provided um, parenting classes for individuals that were court-ordered to attend parenting classes. And the employee of Hope for Children gets romantically involved with the man who's court-ordered to go through the classes. And that person loses their job. The, this particular decision stood for the proposition that a conflict of interest doesn't just deal with financial interests, it can also deal with these kind of personal conflicts. And so that there was sufficient grounds for that termination. Next one comes out of Illinois. And in this particular case, an employee of the Department of Health Care and Family Services was terminated for improperly authorizing benefits for her friends and relatives. Um, so she was giving some like SNAP benefits, Medicaid-type benefits, those kinds of things. And, and she was terminated as a result of that. So she was overlooking some of, the, some of the reasons or some of the justification that you need to give in order to um, get those types of benefits. And I've heard of similar situations arising even in the state of Utah where you have a court clerk who reduces fines or eliminates tickets for friends and families. That's clearly a conflict of interest and warrants termination based on this statute. The next case comes out of the state of Louisiana. And this one, I think, also goes to outside employment, which is really an important issue for many of you. Here, there were uh, several New Orleans Police Department employees who were disciplined for violating the department's rule prohibiting formation of an LLC for off-duty police officers paid details. And what I think is the issue here, and some of these cases lack real definition of the facts that give rise to these cases, but in this particular situation, it appears as if there were several police officers who formed an LLC, and so they were sort of the middleman. They were, and they were getting paid for their services of providing off-duty um, police officers for various functions. And so the, what the, the police department said was that that's against um, the county policy, the city policy, discipline these people, they appealed, and it was, up, it was upheld, their discipline was upheld as being violative of the policy. So that's another thing to keep in mind. This, this case um, comes out of, also out of Louisiana, and this one is pretty, pretty much no brainer. Uh, there was a person that worked in the office of group benefits um, for uh, the state of uh, Louisiana, and uh, he was one of the people that decided whether or not an individual would get certain medical care and treatment, whether or not they would be able to get a wheelchair, and then they would help process the um, billing through Medicare. Well, he also happened to own the wheelchair company, and so he was authorizing all these wheelchairs, and there was some federal investigators that went in and said, you know, there's some billing problems here. And then all of a sudden they go, oh my goodness, you are the guy that decided this individual was supposed to get a wheelchair. We have a little bit of a conflict there. So that was pretty obvious. And hopefully we don't have anything that, that uh, blatant. Real quickly, um, there's a couple of inconsistent cases that came out of the state of New York. I don't know quite what to make of them. In this, this case, uh, Hayes versus Abitable, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, the plaintiff brought a proceeding seeking to remove the mayor from an office because they were claiming that he was simultaneously holding the office of mayor and village constable and there was a conflict of interest. And so he was, he was in essence thrown out of office and they said that's unscrupulous conduct or gross dereliction of duty and threw him out. But then, there's this next case out of the state of New York that I think is really inconsistent. So here we have a town supervisor um, who also had an appointment with an insurance agency, and the insurance agency actually did business with the, with the town and actually procured contracts with the town 
uh, for insurance. And also, while he sat on this board, he was the one that appointed his wife to a town board and approved his, her salary. And they said, and the New York Supreme Court Appellate Division said, I, we don't see any conflict of interest there. I personally do. <laughs> and I think that most of us in this room think that there's a problem as far as that's concerned. So I think that that's, that's an issue. Um, we're really close, I promise. This um, Wesler versus Shelby County, Tennessee. In this case, there was a county plumbing inspector who was terminated after it was discovered that his adult son, who lived with him, ran his own plumbing uh, company out of the family home, and the son was not licensed, didn't get permits to do the work. And so they fired the county plumbing inspector, saying, how could you let this happen under your own nose? and you don't do anything about it. Well, the, the Tennessee Court of Appeals affirmed the Chancery Court's ruling that said, no, you can't terminate him for that. that. That's, you know, what his son does is his son's problem. Now, it would have been different, perhaps, if he had allowed his son to do this on a particular project that he was in, um, inspecting. I think that would be the difference. And finally, Cap versus Texas Workforce Commission. Employers' policies that require all employees to obtain approval before accepting secondary employment in his or her off-duty time was not unreasonable. And I think that that's important because I think that it's incumbent upon us to know what our employees are doing outside of the, um, their employment with us. And there is a distinction between what's, what's illegal and in violation of the law as opposed to maybe some human resource issue if they're just over-retired or they're not performing their jobs well. There may be a conflict of interest over here that warrants greater sanctions or greater action. But over here, I think we're well within our um, purview to say to them, look, at your outside job is making it so you're late to work all the time or you're tired, you can't do what you're doing, what you need to do, and we expect to be primary as far as that's concerned. So that we can take that position. Takeaways, know the law, make sure you have uh, county-specific conflict of interest policies. I went out, I, well, I actually had Ann, who works for me, go out and, and pull off as much as she could of the county-specific conflict of interest policies, and we could get a number of them. I think it's great to have them out there. So there's public access, and also, so there's access by your employees to see what those policies say. Educate your employees. When you hire them, educate your employees perhaps every year on their annual review. Make sure they understand what their duties and responsibilities are under this. Make sure that they know that they have to do these disclosures, get approval, because that way you're protecting not only yourself and the county, you're actually protecting that employee as well, and you won't end up in the headlines. Encourage people to be forthcoming, talk about these um, outside employment opportunities they have or outside interests. Keep your eyes and ears open. Talk to employees if you find out that there's something going on that you may consider to be a conflict. Seek legal advice from your county attorney if there's any issue. And again, I think the bottom line is make sure your people know to disclose, disclose, disclose. And I think that's exactly what Bradley was telling you at the very beginning of this. So. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I know that I probably went over a little bit, but if any of you have any questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to ask me at any time or give me a call. Thanks.